Hello and welcome back everyone. Happy Friday. Today we're going to be going over Tinto Maps number 5, which details uh, the region of Italy for the upcoming game Project Teaser, or as I like to call it, Project Taizai. Um, uh, going into this, um, we also have some other things we are going to be looking at today, uh, which is we are going to be looking at the dynastic map that was present in the previous Tinto Talks, um, uh, just kind of briefly looking over it, and then also, when discussing the resources, it seems that we have this coming from Johan, uh, which I think is a list of all the resources, I'm not sure exactly what this uh, is, uh, but this is, a, if this is a reference of all the resources, I kind of want to go through it, uh, because we haven't seen this before, and so let's continue on, and get into it. Okay, hello everyone and welcome to the fifth Tinto Maps. That doesn't sound like a happy Friday, but okay. This week we will be sharing a map of Italy. One comment before we start. Okay, so this is where they wish us a happy Friday, obviously, right? Um, we know that you might be eager to discuss the other regions that are may, may appear partially on the Dev Diary, such as the Balkans. Let's try and keep the conversation separated in different threads, please. Every region will get its own Tinto Maps and we will show uh, them and gather feedback uh, in due time in their own DD. Man. I don't, I'm not sure if I've ever seen Happy Friday misspelled worse, uh, but um, they did wish us a Happy Friday. So let's continue on. Um, coming up uh, with that, let's uh, let's start. Yeah, of course. Uh, here are the countries. Uh, we do see a big Naples here, uh, big Provence, big Milan, big Verona. We see, of course, Venice, which Venice is not represented as an island. More on that later. And of course, we also see Bosnia, son. Um, the situation in 1337 is quite interesting. The main power in the peninsula is the Kingdom of Naples, ruled by Robert I, who's also the ruler of Provence, and a few minor countries in northern Italy. His efforts towards the domination of Italy also made him the leader of the Gula faction uh, in Italy. So this is going into what they were talking about in regards to the Italian flavor for the Italian wars, how there will be multiple factions, uh, which backs the Pope. Speaking of him, the seat of the Curia is in Avignon, uh, and is regaining control and is regaining control over the Papal States and moving it back to Rome might take some time and effort. Um, so wants to move back to Rome, makes sense. Opposite all of them is the Ghibelline faction, sorry if I mispronounce everything, which I will, uh, led by uh, the Signoria of Milan, ruled by the Visconti dynasty. Uh, they are backed by other important powers in the Italian region, such as the superb Republic of Gen Genoa, the Duchy of Verona, ruled by the dynasty of Della Scala. There are also neutral powers, like the powers of, of uh, Republics of Venice or Sienna, although they can be attracted to join one of the factions, and we also have foreign powers that have already set a foothold in Italy, such as the Crown of Aragon, which has established the branch of its dynasty uh, as kings of uh, Sicilia, while also recently conquering some much needed lands in Sardinia. So um, we see down here, uh, we see the first faction of Naples plus Provence, um, and then down here we see kind of a factional map of Milan plus, you know, some of the northern boyos, um, which will be nice, uh, and this nice little chunk of Aragon that has been, or a nice little chunk of Sardinia that's been taken uh, by uh, Aragon here. Uh, and so, okay, moving forward, um, they are showing international organizations for this, and we have the locations map, which is going to be quite nice. Um, uh, coming in here, I'm not uh, uh, familiar with the naming of the regions, uh, you know, for all these things, so uh, it's hard for me to comment on whether or not these are appropriate. We do see a nice little separation of the Alps. It'd be a shame if uh, someone took some elephants and crossed them, but man, those are some windy kind of pathways in there, so tactically speaking, might be kind of an interesting, the, the barriers that you get from the Alps are going to be interesting to defend or try and push through, which will make it Italy a nice region, again, uh, to defend or try and uh, hold on to uh, from a, uh, you know, marching geography standpoint. If you build some big forts here uh, and then have a big navy, you should be pretty safe uh, because it'll be effectively an island. But speaking of uh, island, uh, I think that, okay, there's, there's an interesting density in Italy, especially in the northern wall. There are plenty of communes, the Italian city-states. You also might notice something different from previous grand strategy games, speaking of islands. Venice is not an island, but the location uh, it has lands around the lagoon. We aren't 100% sure this will be the final design, as that we have a few ideas to keep the special posi uh, position on an island inside of the lagoon while addressing the issue of being too small to appear on map. This, In this regard, uh, we're open to feedback and ideas on the topic. Now, I'm not an expert on the geography surrounding Venice, but here's kind of my understanding of what the problem is, is 
geographically speaking, representing uh, Venice as an island is insane because it is so small. Um, if your map has any amount of, like, uh, it's just way, 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 way too small to represent a, as an island on a map in a map game uh, because you're effectively, like, 100xing the size of it in terms of the representation on your map. However, however, um, my understanding is, is that Venice was defensible by ships. You could use ships to defend Venice. I might be off in this. This might be incorrect. This might just be too much grand strategy game playing. Uh, but it creates this interesting tension where, um, okay, if we want to be able to tactically speaking defend it with ships, but then geographically speaking it has no business being an island, how are we supposed to represent it? Um, it would be interesting if they had navigable rivers and you could prevent someone from crossing the river and they just gave it like a river modifier uh, and they just named the river a bog or something like this. Um, maybe it, it'll be interesting to see how it's resolved. It'll be also interesting um, to see what people are saying in terms of how it should be resolved. But yeah, we do have Venice. Uh, it is a little bit of a hanging thing. There are two parties in this regard. I've seen this discussion happen before um, uh, between people much more informed than I am uh, regarding whether or not Venice in games should be represented as an island. And so um, that is kind of probably one of the bigger discussion points that'll happen in this, um, uh, you know, uh, Tinto maps. Um, we do see, uh, scrolling down, we see the provinces, which are much bigger and are probably a little bit more recognizable uh, in terms of uh, the names. Uh, uh, the locations get really down into the nitty gritty. The provinces are kind of more in line with what we've seen in previous games. Um, I think that, is this the trade map? No, not quite yet. Uh, but we do see kind of this regional, it's all kind of greenish. And then when we get into the Balkans, it starts turning into a different color. For terrain, we see a lot of Mediterranean, uh, a little bit of subtropical, subtrop some oceanic, uh, some continental. Uh, this is probably the most varied uh, map we've seen in terms of terrain. Uh, we also see a little, or sorry, climate rather. We also see a little bit uh, at the bottom here of, uh, this might be arid uh, in Tunisia, and so that'll be cool. Uh, there's also a little bit of um, brown over here, or cold arid rather. Okay, cold arid here, cold arid down here. And so uh, this will represent uh, kind of a little bit of a more, uh, like last map we saw, it was a 100% continental, uh, if I recall correctly, when we were taking a look at this. This is from the previous week. Yeah, we got the 100% continental. This is much more uh, diverse. Uh, and then we see this is the topography map here. Um, and this one, uh, we see huge mountains jutting up in all of over here. And they kind of just uh, surround here. If you, hills and mountains give a bonuses, right, uh, to defense, you're going to see, obviously, you place forts on these hills and mountains. And then... Um, it's going to be really hard to push into Italy from outside of Italy. Um, and so this is like something that's kind of always been true in the the EU4 and the EU3 and this type of stuff. Uh, as long as they're giving some sort of combat modifier to hills. Uh, really easy region to defend that's still uh, technically connected to uh, Europe like by land. It's But it's in some ways it's kind of like an island. Um, like uh, England is, uh, and so as long as you can defend the seas, uh, you can have this be a great power base in terms of a region. Um, c uh, scrolling down, we have the uh, vegetation map, uh, where we see a ton of grasslands. Now, I'm still not sure whether or not grasslands will provide us a very significant advantage. Um, uh, they, have, they are better in EU4 because there's less development cost. I'm assuming grasslands are going to give, or sorry, farmlands are going to give... Uh, Okay, so these aren't farmlands. Oh, there's a lot of farmlands too. My eyes just filtered them out. Uh, but there's farmlands and grasslands. Farmlands in particular in EU4 uh, had like the lowest development cost. And so they would be regions that would be really, really nice um, for development. Uh, and this is, I, I think that they're going to be giving good modifiers. And so overall, this is actually one of the more farmlands dense regions that we've looked at, um, uh, which is, uh, I'm not sure to what extent this is going to make this good land versus not good land, or to what extent resources are going to be the really valuable thing, or the overlap of the two. Uh, the three usual layers, something I want to comment on that we've been following in this thread about revising flatlands and hills, and we're trying to have more granularity in the topographical map with the help of uh, this gentleman, whomever he is. 
uh, but okay. Uh, and then coming down here, we see the cultures map mode. A lot of variants here. We, of course, see uh, the, the blending and the stripes showing that there's going to be mixed culture. We see the Sicilians in Sicily, the Neapolitans in Naples, uh, the Umbrians in Umbria, the Emilians in up here, the Lombards, etc. Uh, and just kind of a normal looking thing, the Bosnias, Bosnians in Bosnia, son. Italy is also a region with sharp cultural divisions and plenty of minorities, although they don't appear on the map. There are attacky Jews or Greek or Albanian people in the south, among others. Here we see the religion map mode, little uh, Christanji, uh, but mostly Catholic. I'm, we've seen mostly Catholic in a lot of the regions. Another boring region with more than 90% of the population being Catholic, basically, with uh, the uh, most of the religious minorities being uh, uh, Attackim Jews and Orthodox Greeks. We're considering implementing Waldesians, although adding more divergent Catholic heresies confessions is a bit of a low priority for us right now. As a side note, it might cast your eye the Christangi of Bosnia, son. Uh, we'll discuss them later in a Tinto maps devoted to the Balkans. What the hell is this? What is this? Why are you... At the start, you're like, let's not talk about the Balkans. And then you're like, hey, you know what? Balkans. We're going to be talking about it later. Tease. Okay. Uh, we see the raw goods. So I just wanted to briefly cruise over... Uh, this uh, reference here that we saw I was posted by Johan in regards to raw goods kind of trying to just take a little bit of a rundown through these and think which ones are probably the most valuable I don't know which ones are the most valuable but we'll go through it uh, so we have cotton and sugar tobacco horses um, so cotton as a cash crop is really important for the creation of clothing. I'm not sure how valuable it's going to be though uh, in this time period sugar uh, is uh, sugar is also like, man, I'm just processing everything through Victoria 3. Um, I don't think sugar is going to be terribly important. Tobacco, I don't think we've seen too much tobacco um, in terms of resources. Now, horses are going to be necessary for making cavalry. Um, and so this is going to make it so that whether or not you have horses is going to inform whether or not you can have a cavalry-based army or cavalry formations or this type of thing. So that is interesting. We see clay, sand, coal, which is not super useful early on, but it will be later. Iron, again, will be necessary uh, for some things. So strategically speaking, I think having a sufficient amount of coal and iron, or iron and horses is going to be really important. Uh, but then past a certain point, it's not necessarily going to be the most economically useful. We have copper. Uh, we have gold and silver, which of course I assume are going to be economically outstanding. Stone, um, I assume you want uh, at least some base of stone. It'll be interesting to see if there are areas where, or strategies that if the place has a lot of stone or not a lot of wood or a lot of wood but not a lot of stone, if this informs your building making decisions. We see tin, lead, silk. Um, I'm wondering if you can change some of the European uh, territories to produce silk after silk gets imported from China, eventually smuggled out. Dyes, incense, tea, cocoa, um, a lot of these uh, kind of cash crop uh, plantation based stuff is probably going to be valuable economically speaking if you have like large populations that have demands for it, um, but less so for like kind of the vertical building construction consideration. We see coffer, coffee fiber crops. It'll be interesting to see if fiber crops are more useful than cotton or if they replace cotton in a lot of things. Uh, we've seen some PMs where they do replace cotton. We see ivory. I'm going to assume ivory and furs are going to be valuable. Lumber, important for construction, I assume. Salt was extremely important in the early times. I don't know how important salt is now, but it was important as a preservative uh, and allowed uh, humans to travel, like, uh, in terms of, like, prehistoric times. It allowed humans to travel uh, uh, further from the coast and this types of things um, with the help of uh, being able to preserve meat and stuff. Um, there's a book on salt that I've been meaning to read, but we haven't gotten to it, so that's what is what it is. We have medicaments, uh, gems, which of course, gems, pearls, and ambers, we expect all these to be valuable, and then saltpeter. It'll be interesting to see if you try and make sure that you acquire saltpeter, um, uh, you know, kind of reserves or whatever, um, before gunpowder, uh, and then we see alum, spices, wine, elefantes, uh, which is interesting to see as a good, um, I'm wondering what exactly they're going to be useful for. Um, surely that, 
I mean, like, I, I don't think they were used militarily in this time period, so it's interesting to see this as good. I wonder if it's just an extension of ivory. Uh, that one's kind of... I, I'm not sure what to make of elephants. Were elephants used in warfare in this time period? Maybe in India. Maybe that's what it's about. Uh, and then we see marble and mercury for the hat making. Okay, so taking a look... At the map we have here, uh, we see that there is, okay, there's a lot of areas that are uh, kind of impossible to access because they're uh, in the Himalayas, but in, interspersed with there, we see a lot of iron. Um, we see a very, very varied map overall where we see a lot of different things. There's a lot of stone down here in North Africa, but we're not supposed to talk about it. Uh, and uh, let's see. Yeah, it's just very... There's a lot of different stuff. We do see a lot of silk, actually, here, though. And I don't think we've seen silk in other places. And so maybe this is going to be one of the main things that you can do as Italy is you can export silk and you can do stuff in your regions to increase the production of silk. I think uh, Italy was one of the places that uh, the silk was smuggled out to from China. Uh, and so this would be interesting if this allows you to, uh, like as Italy specifically, you play a little bit differently where you lean into the silk and you try and export it. Um, other than that, there's nothing that's uh, immediately striking my eye as being too terribly interesting. Uh, other than there's a large diversity, I suppose uh, it actually does look like... Can we zoom in here? It does look like... Uh you know, I don't actually see too many mineral resources. I mean, there's some iron up here. Uh, but it seems like there's not very much iron or copper in the peninsula itself. And it's more uh, agrarian based. I mean, we see a lot of wool. I think that probably more wool overall than in a lot of other places. And definitely a lot more wine. Uh, and so I wonder if this lack of iron is going to be a concern. It's a bit, uh, it's interesting though to like look through uh, and think through, uh, especially if like if the play style is different based on your geography and your resource availability, which uh, I think for in the case of silk, uh, it seems very reasonable that it would be. And so uh, Italy is a rich region with pl plenty of interesting raw materials. Um, yeah, I mean, they, they have a really wide, wide variety. That's, they have spices, too. I don't think we see too much spices. Uh, we see spices down here. Um, iron, we see a little bit of lead. I guess varied is the kind of the good way to describe it. I, we don't see much, much copper, gold, or silver, uh, or really iron, I think, relative to other regions. And so maybe that's a, a little bit of their weakness, and instead they have a lot more stuff like wine and wool. Okay, uh, looking at the markets, we see... Uh, kind of, this is like, in terms of importance in EU4, um, the Genoa and Venetian markets are both end nodes and are extremely, like, uh, uh, useful to fight over. I think they're both end nodes. They might have changed which ones are end nodes, to be fair. But there was, like, three end nodes, uh, Venice, Genoa, and Antwerp. Uh, and uh, Antwerp was probably the best. Uh, but it'll be interesting to see how much market fighting there is and how trade-based these guys are because in EU4, um, this region plays as like a really trade-heavy region. Uh, and so it's exciting to see all of this. We do see Naples, we see Pest, uh, we see... Um, I wonder if that's going to be Greek uh, or that's actually in Ragusa there, I think, is the trade node. Um, so it'll probably be that. We see Aragon and then we see uh, up into... Uh, France a little bit. There are three market centers in Italy, Genoa, Venice, and Naples, which was a very, very, very rich country in 1337, the wealthiest of the region. As usual, take into account that one, we don't script the setup, which locations belong to each market. They're assigned automatically to each market. And two, the starting distribution is not final and might change as we do do tweaks between market calculations over time. Kind of interesting to see this little, uh, enclave or exclave or whatever uh, that is part of the Naples market that is wholly contained within the Genoa market. Um, I kind of wish that they wouldn't have that type of thing because that doesn't make sense, right? Um, uh, but, uh, you know, uh, it'll be... The trade struggle between Venice and Genoa is always a bit of a vibe. And I wonder if you conquer one and the other, it, w it should unify, right? Or it should uh, help the calculation to be such that it'd be more likely to unify. It won't necessarily unify. 
Um, but uh, based on like what they were saying about calculations, being in the same country makes it like more likely to be uh, doing this type of thing. Uh, and I think you, you, I'm not sure if you could delete a market. So if you conquered all of Venice as Genoa and then you deleted it, you'd have a massive Genoan market. I don't know if this is a thing. Uh, but it is definitely a consideration. We see the pop map, which is a little bit cleaned up. We see the pops per country. Uh, we see 2.2 uh, million in Naples, uh, or close to a million in Milan. I think this is Verona with 900k. Um, hard to see what uh, Venice has. I can't really identify how much Venice has, uh, which is a little bit unfortunate. The Papal States have 900,000, uh, and uh, over here is around half a million in... Uh, what is it? I forgot the name. Provence? That's it. Um, we see the, the sharper map, and this map is just like a huge struggle to read. Uh, so we're not going to try and pick out... Actually, I want to see how much Venice specifically has. Venice specifically has 155,000, it looks like. I can't scroll when looking at this map, but can I dr click and drag? I can. Um, it looks like there's a lot up here, 113k. Uh, is there a massive 114k we see down here in Naples? Um, that has to just not be rendered correctly, or there's 10 billion people? No, there's 10,000 there and 10,000 there. They're just, like, rendered directly next to each other, so it's awkward. What about Carthage, where the earth was salted? Never forget. Okay, uh, there's around 10.5 million population in the Italian region as of now, taking into account how divided the political landscape is. Naples looks scary. And that's all for this week. Um, for the next one, we will be talking about the British Isles. Ooh, British Isles with uh, St. Davy, UK. Uh, and so this has been a nice little one. Uh, of course, we do have a couple other things to briefly talk about, uh, which is uh, going to be just kind of scrolling through all the images here, uh, coming back to the Italian one. We did want to talk about, uh, briefly, uh, this uh, huge map that is the, uh, uh, what is it, the dynastic map, because it gives us, this is the biggest uh, in terms of map we've seen um, uh, for, like, the European region, and we are getting a good uh, sight of, like, everything. We're seeing uh, Aragon's, like, uh, extra territory. Uh, we're seeing Hungary, and to be fair, we've seen a lot of these maps at this point in time. I'm really excited for the Balkans map. We'll be getting the uh, England map soon. You can see all these little different regions in Ireland. Uh, we could see that the Plantagenet uh, is in charge of at least Wales right now, uh, but it is a border, so they're separate countries. Uh, but that is the dynasty. Uh, we see a little bit of them down here. The de Valois, uh, I think, has multiple countries under that singular dynasty. And there was something mentioned about reintegrating dynastic um, uh, people that are part of your dynasty that had separated. Uh, there was some uh, noise about those mechanics. Um, we don't see... Is that Habsburgs are... Are Habsburgs on the throne? I can't read that. I don't know if Habsburgs are around at this point in time. Uh, but we see all the little different speckles and all the different little uh, countries in Germany. Uh, and so uh, I just thought we'd take a quick look at this. There isn't anything, when I was looking at this earlier, there wasn't anything that I thought was too crazy or revealing um, relative to the information we have so far in regards to the dynastic map, but it is nice to see all of Europe together now. I know there are people on Reddit uh, compiling the different regions, uh, you know, maps, uh, especially the political maps, to try and uh, create a massive uh, sort of Europe, uh, and this is kind of like that, what we would be achieving with that. And so this is nice to look at. But anyways, uh, that's the that's the Tinto maps for today. We took a look at Italy. I hope you guys enjoyed. If you did, please feel free to like, comment, subscribe. And other than that, have a happy Friday.